Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RegimCity.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Intel, because the city of Providence are suing Intel. For how much? 5 million? 20 million? 500 million? No! 5 billion US dollars. Ow! And sticking with Intel, but some better news, they have unveiled some details on the GPU prototype which is being worked on by former RTG head Alaja Kadori. A small note, I did say this in the other video I'm recording today, but still, I uh, just want to make it abundantly clear, I'm using a different mic to normal because I had some audio equipment that I took over to Amy's house. She's currently sick with bronchitis slash a chest infection. Not great. And frankly, I just don't want to enter the plague zone to just getting well myself. So unfortunately, we're going to have to make do with the less than optimal audio equipment for the next day or two. But hopefully, you know, things will get back to normal as soon as possible. But with that said, let's begin with the news. So the city of Providence are suing Intel for 5 billion US dollars. Why? I think you can probably assume the answer, can't you? It's Meltdown and Spectre, of course. So currently, as of the 15th of February this year, that's 2018, Intel have been hit with 32 class action suits over Meltdown and Spectre. But while 5 billion does sound an awful lot of cash, Think of it this way, in 2016, Intel reported a full year revenue of about 60 billion US dollars, and indeed in their last filings they also have actually beaten expectations despite the absolute crap storm of Spectre and Meltdown. So the plaintiffs are essentially telling us that they're left with three choices, which, being honest, is pretty much true. The first is that they make do with the system they have at the moment and patch it. The problem is if they have an older process in particular, performance is going to go down. How much depends on how old the processor is. Skylake or newer, less of a big deal. Haswell or older, especially if it was say several generations older, it's going to go down significantly. The other option is they don't patch it and they decide to just not patch at all and leave the system with the vulnerability in place. Well, obviously, in which case, they are now open to attack, which is probably not a good idea. Honestly, I would always choose the patch over being vulnerable. Unless it was something like just a pure gaming machine. Even then, I would be a bit dicey, especially if it's on a network, but hey, that's your choice. The last option, and probably the other obvious option, is you simply buy a new machine. But that means you've got a choice of either buying a new Intel system or a new AMD system. And as people are going to immediately point out in the comments, currently the processors in Intel's uh, case still have the meltdown vulnerability, but they're less susceptible in terms of the performance degradation from the patches. Or from AMD's point of view, you still kind of have to worry about Spectre, but it's not really likely in real-world scenarios. But until they actually patch this stuff in hardware, which is going to be another couple of generations time most likely, well, these are choices you're going to have to live with. And the plaintiffs are actually using Intel's own ads to help them in the court case. Intel regularly touts the security of its processes in its marketing materials. For example, Intel advertises the processes offer data protection with hardware-assisted security and ensures data protection through innovation. In one instance, Intel emphasized a key component of its approach to security is providing more robust, vulnerable, resistant platforms. Security features are embedded in the hardware of Intel processors, including three of Intel's newest server processors, the Xeon E3B3 family, the Xeon processor E5 family, and the, e, the Xeon processor E7 family, as well as the latest generation of core um, Intel Core V Pro processors, Intel's advertisements routinely focus on security measures built into its processors. Therefore, the lawsuit is essentially alleging that because back in June of 2017, Intel learned that its microprocessors suffered from the defects known as Spectre and Meltdown, they believe that the processors which are affected are no longer fit for intended use. In other words, the lawsuit is simply alleging that, hey, hey, 
you told us that it's secure, but in actuality, here's these issues. How is the lawsuit going to go? Well, honestly, it's impossible to know. I mean, Intel, at the end of the day, have fairly decent lawyers, I'm going to suspect. But I imagine any lawyers working on this particular lawsuit are also going to be pretty damn good as well. I mean, let's face it, with five billion US dollars on the line, it's not like this is just chump change. It's not like it's, you know, a million here or a million there where, okay, you know, Intel might not care that much, but with this, it opens up a risk for further lawsuits for Intel, and quite frankly, I think we're going to hear an awful lot more class action lawsuits popping up. Okay, now on to some good Intel news, and this is the discrete GPU prototype development has been somewhat disclosed by Intel that they've been working on. So, you might recall Larrabee, which ended up not doing exactly what Intel had hoped for. It ended up essentially being a HPC accelerator. Intel eventually decided to hire Raj Akhodori, who was in the middle of a sabbatical from AMD, and has released a myriad of slides. Now, just to clarify what you're going to be seeing here is not clock speed. It's not tell telling us the teraflops. It's not telling us what memory type it's going to be using or let's say the um, amount of cash each execution unit has available to it or whether it makes you a cup of coffee in the morning. Instead it does give us a ground ha 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 considering we're dealing with a lot of voltages plan of the overall architecture from a power efficiency standpoint. Now it looks like this is essentially scaling up an iGPU so what we have here is an existing iGPU architecture that Intel have already created, but they're simply, I guess you could say, making it more robust and able to sustain higher clock speeds and with additional components and execution units. So the company unveiled this at IEE, International Solid State Circuits Conference, and then these slides were snagged by PC Watch. So the components essentially are based right now on Generation 9 architecture, and we see three execution units. Now, once again, you should not pay necessarily attention to those because although we see three execution units, this is more of a proof of concept. Intel are essentially telling us this is the direction we're going, but it's not really the end goal. It's more kind of to almost just prove that we can take our existing technology and tweak it. So the three clusters are wired to a clock management and power management system and it's able to adjust the power and clock speed of each individual EU in a fine-grained manner. You'll also note the double clock speed mechanism and this does pretty much what you would imagine. It doubles the clock speed of the boost state beyond what generation 9 EUs can currently handle on an Intel iGPU. So its frequency range right now operates between 50 megahertz, yeah, that's right, just 50 megahertz at 0 0.51 volts to 400 megahertz and 1.2 volts and runs with 1.5 billion transistors and it's going to be built on a 14nm process. So the first chip is the GPU and also the system agent. The second chip is comprised of an FPGA and that is to actually interface with the system bus. Now don't forget we have two GPUs that AMD, sorry, that Intel are telling us that they're working on. One is Arctic Sound, the second is Jupiter Sound. So this actually follows closely to what the Motley Fool actually tweeted out late last year. Uh, they said that uh, the Generation 12 GPU core would be codenamed Arctic Sound and it would likely follow the design used by Intel in the KB Lake G processors and then the 13th generation would be called Jupiter Sound. So Arctic was going to be based once again on the GPU found in Kaby Lake whereas 13th uh, generation is more of a successor. So I'm kind of curious to see how all of this goes quite honestly. It wouldn't surprise me if generation 12 was almost like Intel I guess the best way of describing it was getting their feet wet to kind of get their heads around it and almost like the proof of concept to 
kind of just get something taped out and to get something working. And then they can take that because obviously Jupiter Sound, in theory, will be much behind it in terms of the layout and the actual, sorry, the design and the tape out. So I'm assuming what they can do is use what they learn on the 12th generation to then, uh, I guess, kickstart and improve the design of the 13th generation. I think it's cool, to be honest, that Intel are getting into the GPU market. And quite frankly, I think from the perspective of, well, you know, Intel, they need to do it. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the GPU market is huge. And while it's very tempting to say, well, Intel um, will be the third player in the GPU market, that's not the case, of course. There are actually other GPU manufacturers other than AMD and NVIDIA. The problem is they're not making things for gamers, for the desktop, or in oftentimes even for HPC. Instead, they've been really focused on mobile, tablets, that type of thing. The other question that I'm getting quite often is, well, can the market tolerate it? And the answer, yes, it can. I mean, GPUs right now are insanely popular. And you can actually do a Google. I'm not kidding you. Um, because of mining, GPUs are being so well sought after that telescopes being used to look for alien life quite literally utilize the GPU to analyze the data but they can't get enough GPUs when they're building the actual telescopes. Just think about that for a second. Think of just how insane that is of a problem. You're trying to look for bloody ET, but you can't get enough graphics chips. I mean, seriously. The, the stuff that happens in technology, you literally could... It's almost like a bloody Greek play. It's so tragic sometimes. It's almost like stand-up at the same time. It's so It's so bloody bizarre. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's, it, to me, it's just crazy that this is happening. But hey, I don't mean that in a bad way, but it, it's just, it's just, it's just one of those things that you wouldn't really think of. And then you're like, yeah, I guess actually a GPU would be kind of handy with that. And then, oh yeah. So as I said, the market can easily tolerate it. The biggest problem at the moment is actually the supply of RAM, uh, memory. But I feel that that's probably going to be less of an issue in the next year or two as more many memory manufacturers, excuse me, uh, manage to ramp up production. With all of that said, hopefully we'll do the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.